feel like I'm, I'm, I came in here on two wheels. You would think three wheels or three hours from Clemson would have been enough, but we just hit stop after stop after stop. So I um, appreciate you guys coming out and braving the elements and all that. I uh, want to go through a couple of things before we turn it over to our esteemed panel here. Uh, a couple of logistical items first. If you need to use the restroom right outside this door or if you go out the door to the back, you can loop around and it's, and it's right here. Uh, kind of the timing of the events for today is I got a couple of housekeeping items I want to go through right now. And then I'm going to turn it over to our panel uh, to kind of talk through night operations. And we, and we have uh, spoken before. There's a, a very short uh, eight or nine slide PowerPoint deck that's loaded. And that's for uh, the panel to provide a little bit of information. But the goal here, especially with a group this size, is... Um, Interaction. And we've talked about this before. If you have questions, ask them. You know, and there's going to be time after this presentation, which is, you know, 20 ish minutes or so. Um, the hope is that there'll be some discussion for you guys to share some of the experiences that you've had, ask these guys questions about how they might have done it, you know, share some of their experiences. So the intent here is for this to be interactive. And you know, that was one of the core things of why Skyduck was founded, really in this room, a couple of years or so ago, to have this community and uh, have this networking. So now that COVID is starting to get, you know, in the rear view mirror, kind of excited about being able to pick that back up and, and start networking with one another. Okay, so about an hour or so, we kind of have budgeted for that. But what we've also got is, uh, you, you might have seen a couple of posters that are around here. Um, these are uh, posters from USC, and we've got one over here from Clemson. Um, and this is something that we want to start doing at the um, at every quarterly meeting, um, where if you are doing something cool, you know, it doesn't have to be academic or anything like that. But if you're doing something cool with drones or something that you want to share or maybe network with anybody, you can put something like this together. It doesn't have to be a poster, but maybe a, a, a display or something to start some conversation. And the idea is after these guys that are talking, walk around. And, uh, you know, Colin and I, Colin's a PhD student that's working with me. Uh, we'll stand over there by our poster, and the authors of these posters will stand near theirs. Come by and talk, and we can look at some things, point to some things, and we can have some discussions about the stuff that we're doing, and you can, again, just have some discussions about that. So take advantage of the, of the poster now, and also this is an invitation for our next meeting. Again, if you have something to share, you know, just reach out, and, and we'll, we'll give you some, some wall space to do that. Do want to recognize a couple of our sponsors that make this happen. One, uh, Bentley Systems has been our founding industry partner from the beginning. They're a software developer, and if you're not familiar with them, the DOT uses them a lot. Um, and they have a product of, of many called Context Capture. That's a 3D drone to map solution. And you guys as Skyduck members have an academic license for free. So if you guys are interested in, in playing around with that, uh, reach out to me. Our next quarterly meeting will actually be in Clemson where we demonstrate that software. So um, uh, take advantage of that. Airworks Unmanned Solutions is a sponsor. Uh, Stephen Baxter was one of our panelists, but he, he got sick, actually. And, um, you know, he's, he's, I think he's actually in the ER, so we're kind of wishing him well there. But um, he, he own, he's an owner-operator of Airworks, and they're a drone uh, uh, provider. So if you have any needs there, reach out to him. Uh, uh, cross flight uh, cross flight sky solutions is an educational firm here so if you have any educational drone needs cross flight uh, sky solutions is a, is a resource and then our newest uh, sponsor which we got just this week is zephyr drone simulator uh, that's actually part of what we're colin and i are doing some research with so they're a partner of us and a great tool to um, sharpen your piling skills without having to leave your desk and it's a really great tool Okay, so with that, um, let me go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, we'll start with Scott Newsom. Um, I won't go through all of the of his credentials, but he is um, director of the of, uh, City of Charleston Department of Police, chairman of the South Carolina Aviation Association Safety Committee, and a FAST team rep. So thank you for coming out. And then Daryl Jones, uh, he works for the uh, Forest Protection, or he's a Forest Protection Chief for the South Carolina Forestry Commission. Owner and operator of a drone that drops bombs, although he probably doesn't call it that, <laughs> but uh, a little bomblet, which is really fun to watch. He's been with us. He's on the, he's on the board with us. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys and um, to kind of lead the discussion. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, thanks for uh, having us today. Uh, the goal today for me uh, is to share some experiences 
experience with you uh, as a uh, UAS operator um, and on the regulation side as a uh, FAA safety team representative. Um, we got our drone program started up, uh, when I say started up, I mean literally from writing policy and that sort of thing back in 2015. So before Part 107 became uh, a live regulation. Um, and today we've got a, a, a team stood up. Uh, everybody's a Part 107 certificated pilot. Um, and I, I think the one thing I'd say, we're going to talk specifically about night operations uh, today. Um, so I, I want to ask a couple of questions. So in the room in here, who, who is a Part 107 certificated pilot by a show of hands? So almost every single person. That's great. Okay, for our public safety folks, how many of you guys fly under 107? Does anybody fly under a certificate of authorization or otherwise known as a COA? All right, we'll talk about that a little bit in some detail because there's uh, the reason I ask that there's some differences uh, with the regulations when you're flying under Part 107 versus a COA. Uh, there's certainly advantages to each of them. COA is, in some cases, a little more stringent, higher regulations. In other ways, it's looser. Um, before these nighttime lance authorizations, which just came about, um, the only way you could fly at night <coughs> was was either with a Part 107 certificate and a uh, a waiver through the paper process. It was known as drone zone, and, and uh, the 90 days was the minimum time it would take to get it. Uh, and unless you got a wide a wide area authorization, you weren't doing much night flying, at least legally. And that's why we elected to go with a COA, because a COA does allow you to fly at night um, without that wide area authorization. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit, because one of our slides is going to talk to that a little bit, so I wanted to clear that up. So what I want to talk about, and I'm sure Daryl will follow with me, I, I understand they do a good bit of night flying as we do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the differences uh, of flying in the daytime versus at night. If, if there is any regulations that talk specifically to nighttime flying, and uh, I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, I don't mind talking a lot, but I, I, I like it a lot better when somebody's asking questions. So, uh, depending on the number of questions, we can either do that as we go, or I can finish up the world. We'll, Take questions after that. So, you know, can you get me to the next slide? I will. I will. Oh, because I don't have the mouse. Yeah, you can just hit the space bar. But I got it. Okay, we're good. All right. So, <clears throat> just a couple of talking points here. Um, as I just stated, um, <clears throat> these commercial night operations um, can be flown under Part 107 or Part 91. Uh, but it's, that's with a certificate of authorization. Part 91, if anybody here doesn't know what it is, that's basically a manned flight regulation. Part 61, is, that's all the licensing and medical stuff, and Part 91 is the flight operations part uh, for manned flight. Um, but the important, the, the important discriminator up there is commercial night operations. As everybody in this room knows, if you've got a 107 license, um, recreational flying, by definition, has really been skinny down. There's 10 points, and if you're not meeting all 10 of them, whether you've got a license in your pocket or not, you've just morphed into Part 107. And that gets the FAA's antennas up. Um, so we're talking specifically today about uh, commercial operations because recreational flying is under a federal statute, 44809, and that doesn't affect anybody in here unless you're flying your own drone at your house or something. Um, <clears throat> at night, anti-collision lighting is required per regulation. So we're going to get into more detail about that. Um, any of you that are flying off-the-shelf drones, um, 
they likely have some sort of lighting on them right out of the box. That that is not anti-collision lighting. Um, we'll talk about that. And we're going to talk a little bit more when we get into these other slides about the importance at night of putting position lights on your drone. Um, there's additional training if you know. How many, let me ask this question. How many in the room <clears throat> have either taken the initial 107 test or the online renewal that contains the night flying material, the new night flying material? So not a lot. <clears throat> so this additional training, and we'll get, we'll get into the details of it. Um, by regulation, you have to be able to show proof of that training. So if you did it online on the FAA's renewal, that is your proof. If somebody were to ever ask you for your renewal, little piece of paper you get when you finish the test, that, that's your proof, because the night training is part of it. There's also commercial uh, applications available that are excellent. I will tell you on my team, uh, we've got 10 folks on the UAS team. Every one of us took a uh, off FAA site test before this new one became available. Um, I recommend it for anybody that's going to be flying at night a lot. Um, I recommend it for everybody, but if you're going to be flying, uh, it's, it's, it's time well spent. Uh, I will tell you, it's not easy. There's so many medical terms in there involving how vision works, how the eyeball works, um, but it's well worth it. And, and if, if you've never flown at night and you go out there and fly at night, you're going you're to notice immediately everything's different. Uh, things just don't look the same. The drone appears to not be behaving the same. Uh, it is, but we'll, we'll get into some of that. Um, you want to say what that off uh, FAA training one was a rubric you talked about? It was. Yeah, so Jonathan Rubric is an uh, aviation lawyer down in Florida. Um, he handles all sorts of aviation civil cases. Um, I guess if folks get in trouble with the FAA, they hire him. Um, but he's also a, a man pilot. He's a certified flight instructor, just an overall good guy, a really solid aviator. Um, and he put that class together with, with a team of uh, medical professionals, uh, vision specialists and all that. And it's just a top notch uh, deal. And part of that training goes into the visual illusions you will uh, expect at night. And I will tell you, they're real. It doesn't take very long before you start saying, what the heck's going on here? And I'll tell you one of the, one of the quickest ones you'll learn is <clears throat> I spend a lot of time in manned aircraft, too. And, and of course, in a manned aircraft, you're always looking at your gauges. You're always looking at your telemetry. And we have that telemetry on our iPads or phones, whatever we're using to look at telemetry. Uh, it becomes important exponentially at night. Uh, especially if you've got that drone at 400 feet and you start back towards home, you'll swear that drone's right on top of you and it's at 50 feet and it's still 300 feet outbound and still at 250 feet. And that becomes important if you're flying, you know, I don't want to say a full stick deflection, but if you're coming in kind of hot, not a big deal if you're out in an open field, but we operate a lot off of rooftops in downtown Charleston. And when you're in a confined space and you're coming in hot and you're surrounded by antennas and things, other obstacles, um, that telemetry is, is not your best friend, it's your only friend at that point. Because you can no longer rely on what your eyes and brain are telling you because it's mixed up because of these known visual illusions. And they're caused because of physiological conditions that are happening inside your eye with the rods and cones and how they're behaving at night versus how they do at daylight. In daylight, <clears throat> your main focus is right in the back of the eye in the center. At night, it shifts off to either side. And that's where you start getting these things where your drone is rock solid. Keep in mind at night, you don't have a lot of background. You don't have a lot of context to see what's going on. And you'll swear the drone's drifting, and it's, it's really not drifting at all. 
And that's what these classes will tell you. And I think it's important because, I mean, I knew it from man flight. If I'm flying from Clemson to Charleston at night in a helicopter, I mean, obviously the helicopter's moving, but if, if I'm meeting something head on, it looks stationary in the daytime, but at night it doesn't look stationary. Same thing with these drones. When you're looking at the drone, it's going to appear to be drifting and that sort of thing. And it, it's not drifting. You've got to pay attention to your telemetry. That's why it's important. <clears throat> and I'm sure you all know there's, a, there's a, always an ongoing argument in the 107 world. Is a visual observer required by regulation or is it not? Um, the answer is it's, it's not. Um, we won't fly them in the daytime but at least, without at least one visual observer. There's too much going on in that airspace, especially if somebody's down in, down in the telemetry of their down setting camera settings or something like that. There's too much going on to be watching all the airspace. We've got a ton of helicopters down there that are flying in the airspace below 500 feet. Um, so we're heads down a lot. Um, so <clears throat> now, I think nobody in here had a COA. But if you did, I want to talk to that a little bit. Um, COA is an, it's an interesting legal instrument. Um, it's crazy as it sounds, a, a public entity like a police department, fire department, something like that, they, they could get a helicopter um, from the federal surplus program and they could literally fly that machine with a non-certificated pilot. They could do internal training and he could fly with no FAA pilot's license. But only under the direction of that COLA. And, it, and that's where your restrictions will be. You can't do this, you can't do that. Now, nobody does that in real life. Decades ago, they tried it in Buford and it didn't last long. Um, but the COLA is interesting because <clears throat> you can't be violated for anything under 107 because you're not flying under 107. Right? So if the FAA says you can't do that, and you say, why not? And you say, that's a part 107.31 violation. Well, we're not flying under 107. So that's what I mean by it loosens it up a little bit. But then there's some other things that are in that are that are tiger, that 107 is a better fit. One of the things on a code is you have to file a no TAM, notice to airmen every time you fly. There's an exception for law enforcement and fire. If it's a hot call and you've got to go right then. You can fly without posting a note, but you have to be able to articulate to the FAA why you did it. Um, and as I said, the remote pilot initial test and renewal test both now contain the night flying. Um, I went and took a look at it. It's, it's certainly not as thorough as Jonathan's program. It's, it's not a fraction of what Jonathan's program teaches you, um, but it meets the FAA's requirements for your knowledge test for night flight. Next slide. <clears throat> All right. If anybody had a part 107.29 waiver, and what that was, you were a 107 commercial operation. This was back before the new test came online. To fly at night, you had to have a waiver. This was that very difficult waiver to get. Even if you did everything right, it was a 90 to 120 day turnaround, and you rarely got it right. You did? I got killed. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so the, the great thing that happened in 2018 when, when they decided we were going to implement this on the, on the recency of currency test or the initial test was. If you pass the initial test or you've done your renewal, you've had that night training um, and you're good to go. The one thing to remember is um, in the daytime, <clears throat> um, in uncontrolled airspace, class golf, class G airspace, you're good to 400 feet AGL. If you're near a structure like a radio tower, or you're doing a roof inspection or whatever, 400 feet above that as long as you're within a 400 foot radius of that structure. Here's a key part of this. At night, in anything other than class G airspace, 
B, C, D, or E, surface area in, in echo airspace. <coughs> you, your altitude is restricted to that Lance grid. Everybody in here familiar with those facility maps and control airspace? Hands? Okay. If I'm down in Charleston International's airspace, which is literally, I can throw a baseball from the police department to Class Charlie airspace. At night, if I'm in a 250 foot grid, that's it. There's no waiver beyond that. Uh, for the law enforcement folks in the room, if you're in Class Charlie airspace in a 250 foot grid, and because of obstacles or line of sight, you have to go above 250 feet. There's a thing called a special government interest waiver, SGI, Sierra Gulf India. They like it to be done online. There's a form you fill out. It goes directly to the uh, regional operations center, uh, and they will grant it almost immediately. If you've got the phone number and it's online, you can make a phone call from the scene and say, this is what we've got. I need to deviate from this 250-foot grid. I need to go higher. They will, they will generally get that air traffic control facility on the phone while you're on there and coordinate that with them. I use them rarely. Uh, I don't like to use them. We have a good relationship with Charleston's Air Traffic Control Center. Um, I wouldn't do this unless they asked me to do it. They said, if you need to, if it's a real hot call, you can call us directly. You don't have to go through SGI. And they'll coordinate it. But that's, a lot of people say, well, what's the out? Go ahead, Jim. Well, I was gonna say, um, do you, and this might be a, a question for the, for the group here's the discussion, but uh, I normally use air map to lance into areas, but uh, at least as of right now, you can't lance into uh, an area at night. So is there a tool out there where you can get lance authorization at nighttime? That, that's interesting because I, I did that not long ago. At I, night? At night, yeah. Okay. I, so I, I, so I tried it that. yesterday, but I did, there might have been something else yeah. that was wrong. Did anyone else have to try to lance in at night? Because that was one of our concerns <clears throat> when this regulation first went live. It wasn't available. Is it air map that you use? Um, I think I use air map more times than not. Okay. I mean, there's several vendors out there. I think I use air map more times than not. Um, great question, but the workaround with that is, um, especially for the public safety folks, if you're if you're boxed in, where uh, some regulations preventing you from flying pick up the phone and call that SGI number. Um, that they will fix it almost immediately. Um, real good group, and uh, I've never had one denied. Um, and we had a call the other night that was a, a train derailment bending some real nasty uh, substance. And it was literally right up against Charleston International. And uh, Fire had asked us to get some drones up kind of get us, we were running a clear camera, but, and this stuff was, was very cold to the touch, so it was leaving kind of a, a real good thermal image along the rail cars where this stuff was landing, what direction it was going. And we had, we were literally right almost at the end of the runway, and they still did a workaround where we could fly. So I, I, know, I know it works. Um, so back to this, um, the drones, um, by regulation, whether you're flying under a COA or Part 107, have to have anti-collision lighting for three statute miles. The important piece of this is, and the FAA is really pushing this message now, um, there's been a couple of, uh, nothing bad happened, but something bad was about to happen. A lot of drone operators are thinking they put these anti-collision lights on, and it's got to be visible for three statute miles so they can see the drone three statute miles away from them. That, that's not what that's for. That's so manned aircraft can see your drone from three statute miles away. Um, there's a lot of bad things that can happen if you're flying three miles away in an off-the-shelf drone. Um, there's bad things that can happen in daytime, and it happens a lot faster at night. 
So the point of clarification is, is <clears throat> visual line of sight is much more than, yeah, I can still see a little speck. I can still see my draw. That's not, we're going to get into the real definition in a future slide of what visual line of sight actually means. Um, not that this applies to anybody. Uh, this thing about the waivers that were terminated, uh, 17 May 21, that did not affect COAs because COAs are not part 107. That's, and I only put that up there in case somebody in the room did have a part 107. Next slide. All right, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, question is, is, is 107.29 established night vision line of sight criteria? And the answer is no. 107.31 is where we find out what visual line of sight requires, but 29 does not do that. Um, this note down at the bottom was added uh, because the FAA is really pushing this message right now. Uh, uh, the three statute model lighting stated in 29 is here so manned aviators can see the drone and maneuver in a timely manner. Um, not so the drone pilot can fly their drone up to three statute miles away and claim, claim that their drone was still within visual line of sight. Next slide. So what are the criteria? <clears throat> so throughout the entire flight, with vision unaided by any device other than corrective lenses, the remote pilot must be able to see the drone well enough to know. This you can see they they've got this stack vertically, uh, sort of sort of uh, you know an acronym. Uh, you've got to be able to determine the location. That's easy enough. You, you can you can still say I see the dot, so you know it's north of me or whatever. You've got to be able to determine the altitude the attitude, the direction of flight. You've got to be able to observe for air traffic in that airspace. And you've got to be able to competently not uh, pose a hazard to others, whether that's other air traffic or folks on the ground. So <clears throat> one of the big differences at night, as I said earlier, is altitude. Um, and, and it's kind of like that in a real helicopter at night when you're sitting in the helicopter, especially if you're over a, a well-lit urban area, not so much. If you're over forest, if you're over ocean, over lakes, I can tell you a thousand feet looks just like a hundred feet, exactly the same. So if, you're, if your drone is half a mile downrange, you're good to go as long as you've got telemetry, but what if you have a hiccup on your device and you lose your telemetry? Uh, I can tell you, if that drone's way off, you're going to have no idea whether it's at 100 feet or 1,000 feet, literally. So that's why it's important uh, to keep the drone in tight enough to where you kind of retain some of the ability to know that altitude. Attitude, which way is it pointing? Um, <clears throat> direction of flight. So I want to talk a little bit about the regulation. If you're flying under a COA, the COA spells out you must have position lights on your drone. Red light on the port side, green light on the starboard side, just like on a real airplane or a real helicopter. Um, if you're cross traffic to other manned aircraft and they see the green light, they know what way you're pointing. They see the red light, they know what way you're pointing. On a drone where it's happy flying in any direction, it's happy flying backwards, it's happy flying sideways, it can, I can just stick to the Inspire, for instance, the DJI Inspire. The red lights are on the front and there's a green blinking light on the back. Could easily be confused for position lights. We run very high intensity position lights. I believe you can easily see those position lights from five miles away, let alone three miles away. And although there's no regulation under Part 107 that requires position lights, the FAA highly recommends that you put position lights on your drone. We use these little cube LEDs. Um, 
We cut Velcro on the drones. We don't run them in the daytime. We don't even leave them on in the daytime. We stick them on at night. Uh, and I can tell you what, it cuts down the pilot workload literally in half. It's such a confidence builder. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing I would caution you on, um, not only is it a great tool, not only is it inexpensive, but if you should find yourself sitting before the FAA uh, because you lost control of the drone and it fell and hurt somebody or damaged somebody else's property, and they say, tell me what you were doing to maintain visual line of sight, and you don't mention position lights, it's going to be a problem. You can hire an aviation attorney and he can argue, well, it's not required. But these regulations, the, the ones that are posted, are a smidgen of what was actually written in the Federal Register. Nobody wants to go read the Federal Register. It's hundreds of pages of just drawn regulations. These are just snippets of that. If I can leave you with one piece of advice, if you're flying at night, use position lights. It's a great tool for you. It's better for the people underneath you. It's better for everybody if you use position lights. And they're inexpensive. Um, those little LEDs, you charge them up with your phone charger. They're not battery operated. You plug them into your computer or something for 10 or 15 minutes and they run forever. Um, but that's the one thing I'd like you to take away if you're flying at night, use position lights. In addition to the anti-collision light that is required, that is a regulatory requirement. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. I, I'm, I'm just going to give you the information. Um, just like man flight, there are minimum uh, weather conditions that you can fly in. There's minimum cloud clearances you must maintain. Um, and they're all, they're all in either Part 107 or Part 91 if you're flying under a code. I will tell you, I was driving in this morning from Charleston, and um, it was foggy the whole way, but it was a ground fog. I bet you'd have broke out of it at 50 feet altitude. But that's that's a no-go. I mean, if you've got ground fog, if you don't know this, fog is a cloud, and you have to be 500 feet minimum below the cloud deck. So fog is a no-brainer. You can't fly in fog. You can do it. You can do it legally under an SGI, but, but if something goes wrong, you know, you've got a real hard time articulating why you thought that was a good idea at the time. But there's there's the bottom line at the bottom line there, literally. Minimum distance the drone may be flown from clouds is 500 feet and 200 feet horizontally from a cloud. Next slide. <clears throat> is a pre-flight required for a drone? Yes. It might not say in Part 107, you must do a pre-flight, but when you read it, you've got to ensure your drone's airworthy, correct? And since drones, at least drones below 55 pounds, don't come with an airworthiness certificate, you as the remote pilot in command are declaring the craft is airworthy. And the only way to do that is a thorough pre-flight. So, that's what I say. It might not say it in black and white. You must do a pre-flight, but when you keep reading, you, you've got you've certainly got to uh, state that it's safe to fly, and that's 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 what this regulation is talking to. Uh, <clears throat> we've got a much more robust checklist for us internally um, that we use. We've got a written plan in our book, but we also have it all on our telephones or our apps. Um, to where we can each, we actually check a green check mark every time we verify that on the drone. When we're going through our weather briefing, when we're going through our crew briefing, um, we acknowledge all of that in the pre-flight. Next slide, please. You can go by that. I can go by. Yeah. So I, I put these up there. You want to snap a picture of them or something? Um, these are lengths. Um, 
How many people in here have FAASafety.gov accounts? Anybody? <coughs> so I, I'm always amazed when I'm talking that I do these webinars for lots of different commercial operators and they don't even know what FAASafety.gov is. And they don't know well, where do I get this training or where do I get this? Almost everything you could ever want to know about a drone is on that top link, faa.gov forward slash UAS. If you've never even seen a drone, held a drone, flown a drone, and you get on that website. Now, I will tell you this. It was funny. A, a, a very well-seasoned, long-time FAA uh, high-ranking guy. I was on a uh, meeting with him the other day. And somebody said, well, why don't they look on FAA.gov slash UAS? And he said, because <clears throat> that website is like from 1990. It's the most unfriendly website on the web. Now, I, I can only get around it because I'm in it all the time. And I know where to look now. But I can understand why somebody's initial visit there would go, uh, I'm clicking out of this. It's just too, it's just too clunky. And it is. But I will tell you, everything you could ever want to know about what does it take for me to get my drone pilot's license, what's on the test, where can I get study material, what are the regulations. Uh, as we move into September of 23, when every drone's going to have to have remote ID, and your drone's going to have a category of one, two, three, or four, the category is going to have to be depicted on the drone if you're planning on flying over people. Every drone's going to have to have a remote ID. That's the site where you're going to find out if your drone, what category it is, if it even has a category. If it doesn't, you're not going to be able to fly it because you can't fly without a remote ID after September of 23. So there's some workarounds for that. Uh, legacy drones, like every one of us are flying right now, they'll have some kind of little clip on device just like these lights that will broadcast out, and that's all that's required is broadcast out. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up with that unless anybody has any questions. Nope. I'm going to turn it over to Daryl. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I'll back up. We, we got our first drone in 2016 in Forestry and uh, started building the program. It was very small and slow at first. We had a co-op initially that we used until 107 came about, really. We, we let that expire. Um, but our use is a little different than most. We we fight five or 6,000 wildfires a year, and a huge component of those are at night. And for me, as a uh, as a fire manager for the state, you know, I'm trying to reduce risk and exposure and increase the safety of my firefighters. So the, the use of drones has been driven by that. So we have a significant aircraft program. Anyway, we have 11 fixed-wing planes and some contract aircraft that we use and National Guard helicopters and tankers and all this that we, we work with regularly. So a challenge for us has been integrating into these other aircraft operations and deconflicting between manned operations and UAS operations. It's been a, a big deal, but we have brought it up basically following the model that we already for our, our other aircraft operations. So we use a lot of risk management tools. We do a, a significant uh, checklist for every mission. We do a risk analysis for each mission and we have to document that just like we do for our big swings. But a lot of our flights end up being at night. And the reason I'm very much proponent of that is I've been the guy digging over here trying to find the hot spots when it was over there. And I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so, so using the thermal cameras that we have to fly as many of our fires at night that we can helps us put out the fires quicker, contain them, secure them, and get away from the smoke. That's really our intention. Keep the fires from coming out and not expose our folks to the smoke. So we did have the 107.29 uh, waiver that we applied for, I think in 2018 we received that and used it until last May when they let those all expire. Um, as we move forward for that, we're just using the 107 uh, rules to fly under. And we're still maintaining and keeping all those requirements that we developed as we wrote our waiver and use those going forward. And just some things to consider if you do have a need to fly at night and you, you 
want to do it. Um, what what Scott said was a good overview within all those regulations. We we set up some criteria for our pilots. We have a pilot one and a pilot two level, and uh, pilot one is our trainer. You know, our, our new pilots. They get a 107 and they do some flight time with myself and our chief uh, manned aircraft pilot. And we sign them off and issue them a drone and get some practice time. They like only, you know, we give them parameters. If they get five hours of flight time and do another check flight, <coughs> we let them <coughs> start to fly at night with at least two visual observers. And we have at least two, so we have different perspectives and we can be looking at the aircraft because of all those, uh, those issues that come up in night flight with the perception and, and which way the aircraft is moving. So we found really valuable to have more than one other set of eyes on there. We do a pretty uh, significant day-long training for our visual observers. We document that, it's good for one year, and they all have to have it, and then they, we refresh that and, and cover those elements again in our pre-flight briefing for those night flights. You know, I, I have a list of people that I know are visual observer trained by our, our standard, and there is no specific standard. You really have to develop your own and document that. But I've got a training software that tells me in two months, you know, somebody's training is going to expire. So we, we are pretty, and we do that with all of our training, for our firefighters anyway, so it fits really nicely. Um, and then to fly the more complicated missions, they have to have more flight hours and they have to have additional check flights with our with our air ops manager and me. And um, they have to have proficiency flights. You know, you can't go more than a month without flying. If you do, you go back to zero, basically. We want our folks to fly. We want them to use the sticks and we want to be familiar and make sure the software is updated and that there are no maintenance issues. So we require proficiency flights just like we do on our main aircraft. Uh, we also do something not a lot of people do, but we regularly close the airspace. We do temporary flight restrictions and we're significant fires, which gets to a whole different level when you have five or six Blackhawks dropping water and uh, high fixed wing aircraft observing and then you want to work at UAS and that to do some thermal or mapping or something else. So it gets really complicated for us. And we, we train to a national standard that I have the luxury of obtaining because we have a national standard for wildfire UAS operations, just like we do for our pilots, our big swing pilots. So we train to that standard and we have our own HD standards that are significantly higher. We try to go above and beyond what's required by 107 and make sure we're protected. For example, the, the the anti-collision lights, you can buy some that say they're three mile, statute mile visibility. How do you know? We've tested ours just to make sure. And I, I've talked to people who were asked, how do you know your lights are uh, are visible for three statute miles? And so our manufacturer said so. Well, you have the documentation. The answer is no. I was in California flying UAS on wildfire and we got a ramp check. The FAA showed up, we had 16 drones dropping fire on a main acre wildfire, and they showed up and said, we want to see all your documentation. And at that point, I realized we had to go fly our drone, put it up with those anti-collision lights, and have somebody three miles away and verify that they could actually see them. Yeah, that's how you document it. We did it on a certain day, and this was the confirmed by radio and the written statement after to say that our lights meet the standard. Because what I don't want, is what Skyler would do, is anybody to question that we were not prepared and we didn't have all of our all of our documentation around. I got a question on the three statute mile. I take it for granted. Is it is the three statute mile just the illumination of that light at ideal conditions, or is it can you see that three miles away given the conditions of the environment you're in? Like if it's a hazy day with smoke, right? Like do you still need to be able to see that light three miles away? Probably a good question for it. The answer to that is <laughs> if you can't see it three miles away, you're not maintaining visual line of sight. So if there's it's smoke or whatever, your light might be, need to be brighter right. to be able so, to see it. Great question. <clears throat> but again, for, for at least most public safety operations, regardless of what that operation is, <coughs> if there's if there's a situation so emergent that and a drone is the only way to mitigate the problem, 
that that's a great choice for a SGI waiver. Now, you're kind of on your own. You're not under 107, so you've got protection. You're no longer going to violate 107 because you're not flying under 107. But if something goes wrong and somebody's injured or somebody's property's injured, there's no protection for any from civil liability at all. So, uh, but the other part of that three statute miles, that's also slant range. So, it's not that I'm here and somebody's holding it. Can I see it three miles away? If 400 feet at a given distance is less than three statute miles linear, that's that's the three statute miles, the slant range. Now, that's not going to come into play very much because if it's a clear night and you're, you know, you're at 400 feet, and, and again, I don't know anybody to be flying that far away anyway, unless it was literally a runaway drone. Um, I mean, I just can't think of a circumstance where you need to do that. Yeah. And it, like I said, I don't know that you need to do that, but I felt like we needed to. So we found a power line on a state forest that was four miles long, and we tested it. Mm -hmm. So I have documents. So, uh, I guess I'm, where I'm going is if you fly at night and have a need for that, you need to think through how you <coughs> document your training and how you document your capabilities and your maintenance on your aircraft and other things. You know, did you do you keep a note every time you update the software? I do, because I know that if something happens, somebody's going to ask me. So I've got the detail that's all in Google Sheets that we use to track all that stuff. Um, you know, how many hours are on each battery and when you take them out of service and, you know, the pre-flight and document and all that info is critical to me because I fly in a lot of complex situations with a lot of aircraft around and it's worth it. So now I've taught our guys on every flight we do the same stuff because, you know, 90% of our flights are not complex, but those 10% are really complex. So there's not... It needs to be standard practice and normal operations to do this stuff so that you don't get caught in the end and when it actually comes to be. So the, the training is critical for us. The uh, the maintenance is key. Um, we use we use it for all kind of, uh, search and rescue recently. We used a murder suspect recently we helped with. And just last week, we located three arson fires using the drone flight at night. You know, we knew we had an arsonist, and we haven't even made the rest yet. But it's coming. <laughs> we will have some news recently. You know, coming out, but, but we were able to document these fires when they were three by three at night instead of waiting until they got to be five acres to find them later. You know, we were able to retrieve evidence and do it. So it helped us just, just that one incident paid for all of my UAS. So um, we do have an agency SOP that we've developed that we follow that details the training and the uh, currency requirements. And really everything about our program, and that's always uh, uh, in flux and always being added to and tweaked. I've never finished it, and I don't think I ever will, because every time I think so, something happens and we realize we need to have it. We also do air admission. We drop uh, spheres from the sky to burn out and fight wildfires and people try fire. So that, that in itself is a whole other set of complications. And doing that at night with a 45-pound uh, UAS, is pretty high stress and, and complicated. So it, it's a, a whole other level for us. That's not common. We do it, but it's not our bread and butter. Most of our flights, short duration, nighttime, map the fire, figure out where the hot spots are, direct our troops to go, uh, to go dig out the heat. We do fly a lot in terrain in the mountains. You know, we're on, on bulldozers in most of the state, but in Upper Greenville, Spartanburg, and Pickens and Oconee, we get in the mountains and we have to put people on the ground. So we track our resources a lot of times. And where where everybody is on the side of the mountain during night fire. So it's all kind of use cases. So you really need to think through what your what your use is going to be and build backwards to make sure you've covered all these things and document it back. I keep going back to documentation, but it's a large part of what we do because I don't ever want to not have the answer and not have the documentation. So I really, I don't have much else to say, but I've, we've done it a lot. We've been in it since uh, 16, and we've been doing the air mission since 19. So, you know, a lot of different applications. And I've, you know, I've flown drones in 25 states already on wildfires. So it's a big deal that's getting bigger for us. It's a risk management. So. Any 
question? Well, this, this is the interaction time. So, <laughs> when, when you're a professor, this is like the scary part, right? When you finish up and then you ask so, uh, I wrote down a couple, but thoughts and questions for these guys. Nobody has any FAA-related questions? That's hard to believe. <laughs> Let me prime the pump a little bit. So you, you had talked about um, um, the takeaway being using positioning lights yeah. in addition to... Um, yeah. uh, can you use the positioning... If you have positioning lights that can be seen for three statute miles, is that sufficient? Can they be also... Can the positioning lights be also used as the anti-collision no. lights? Here's why. <clears throat> Position lights don't, they, they should never be blinking. They should be stationary. They should be static. Red on the left and green on the right. By regulation, the anti-collision light must blink and it must be red or white. And that's why you can't substitute one for the other. And the Keep in mind, I mean, <clears throat> Make no mistake, the blinking three statute mile anti collision light is so a manned aircraft can see your drone, not so you can see the drone. The position lights are for both. They're also for the manned aircraft to kind of figure out which way is that drone turned and what direction it's going. But it's also for you as the pilot to have a real good fix. I mean, if you're looking at that red light and, and and in my case, I can't speak for everybody else's, in my case, my anti-collision light is on the top rear of the drone. If I see the red light and I see the blinking light to the right of it, I know right away that drone's heading to my left, right? If I see the green light and the anti-collision light's on the other way, I know it's heading to the right. If I'm not seeing red or green and I'm seeing nothing but the anti-collision light, I know either the nose or the tail is pointed at me as I'm looking at the drone. So all I have to do is spin the drone 90 degrees. And once I see one of those position lights, now I know exactly where the drone is, what its attitude is, and what its position is. So, so I have a question, actually, and this is for the group here. Daryl had mentioned um, that he has different level pilots. I think he's in one and two. Based, and you have the benefit of having some national resources and standards. But this is actually a question for the group here. Um, I think most people rose their hands and said, you have part 107. But what are some criteria that your agencies have to allow you to fly? I mean, I would imagine it's not just having part 107. Do you have to have a certain amount of training? Are there different levels at your organization where you can do certain things and you get more training and do more things? So uh, kind of an open discussion. but. How is uh, proficiency and, and permission to fly handled with your guys' agency? I can talk for DHEC a little bit. We're working towards doing something with, you know, standardized proficiency, but right now it's part 107, and then, you know, I'll go out with the pilot or Sally will and just kind of, you know, make sure they know what they're doing, spend some time with them. And you know, look, look at how they, how well they handle the aircraft, and then also how well they handle situations, you know, the things that are going on around them before we allow them to become a pick. So yeah, it's kind of an informal. It's not something standardized, but it is something we're working towards. So. Anybody else have a program that you feel bad about not having? I can well, it doesn't have. And let me say something about the DHEC program. The DHEC, all the DHEC pilots have other jobs. There are no DHEC pilots. There are no DHEC. The, the UAS program is sort of in other duties as as your duties require. Except for Uber. Yeah, exactly. I'm just part time. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, we it's not a program. We kind of laughingly kind of dub it as an initiative. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. We do have, you know, DHEC folks do have other jobs. That's their main thing. And some of, you know, some of the pilots, it's not even on their position descriptions. But most of the pilots. Most of them, yeah. yeah. ETB's in the same boat as DHEC. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
we're, you know, we're, we're trying, even like internally different departments, like trying to get the two, the different departments even work together cohesively and say, oh, you know, what do you do as a standard or what do you do this? Or that's a great idea. Maybe we should incorporate, you know, even trying to get us internally to even work collaboratively has been a project in its of itself at this point. That, we, our pilots are not dedicated. They're all our management officers and law enforcement officers or whatever. But uh, we, we did that because we were trying to tie them to the complexity of what they're doing. If it's a forester that it's going to map a track in daylight, you know, and fly around and do some photography, that's one level. But if they're going to fly over a fire, or if they're going to fly at night, or if they're going to fly the ignition device, then they need. That was the reason we did it. It wasn't really, we didn't, we didn't do it intentionally until we realized we needed to stratify between the skill sets and, and the proficiency. So, and one thing I forgot to mention really about night flying in general, you need to practice it as Scott alluded to, somewhere open and do it a few times before you need to do it operationally. So, that, and that was part of our focus to try and make sure that we knew who was current qualified to do it because when we need them to do it on a fire I don't need to be training somebody I'm asking them as a resource so you know the first few times you fly at night it's going to scare you and it's going to be a wildly different situation than you're used to in daytime it's not it's not something that you should do at all haphazardly it's an intentional thing you need to fly somewhere really safe at first and you need to have if possible somebody you know be there with you I mean first time we did it none of us had flown at night to learn it the hard way, you know. But now that we've done it, we're using that to, to make sure others do it. It's a it's a it's not easy and it's not at all the same. So you guys have two levels or do. is that what it is? Yeah. What's the difference there? The initial level is new pilots that don't have a lot of experience that can only fly in daytime. And if they never just recently got your 107 probably. Yeah, those those they get a 107 before they do any field training and check flights basically with our chief pilot and I and um, then we can issue them a drone after and I think it's five hours or something uh, flight time under supervision we can issue them a drone to do mapping daytime non fire missions and for them to move up they need to have 10 hours and additional training time and some additional course work that we have to do before they can fly on fires during daytime and then there's a additional hour amount of hours required for the flat on a fire. So mainly hours and then some other hours, hours right. and check rides and some additional training requirements. Okay. Yeah. What's involved with the check ride? We it's it's not quite a NIST course but we make them do certain maneuvers and fly and uh, you know Practice the return to home process. You know, practice. We we have to call dispatch every time we fly and let our dispatch know we're going in the air because, you know, fire departments show up and they fly their drone and my plane is fixed wings coming in and we need to. You know, I just last week I was flying on a fire and a, my plane was two minutes out. I was on the way down with my UAS and talking, but I found out that a drone was up on the other side of the same fire with the fire department that are not coordinated. So that's a disaster waiting to happen, you know. So, um, you know that that's the kind of stuff we train to and say, hey, what what are you going to do if you hear there's an airplane coming in now? You know, what's your reaction time? Where where are your alternate landing spots? And we drill through that kind of stuff. That's that's really what we do. You're talking about um, service station stuff. Is that I, I work with Civil Air Patrol in addition to applying for well, police department. And with Civil Air Patrol, we've got an initial check ride that we do, which is basically the the NIST, the beeper, to show that you can you can fly this thing, you know. And that's kind of your beginner's permit to go to start your training. And then we do training on you know different search <coughs> methods, you know, a line search, uh, you know, a search on a point, mapping things like that, route searches. That kind of thing and knowledge of using the, the different drone, different platforms we have in Civil Air Patrol. And then once you've completed that training and you feel you're ready for, and you in that training we do um, 
five simulated missions, you know, mission types. Again, you know, a map and run, a route search, an area search, things of that nature for those. And then you finally have a check ride where the, and also in Civil Air Patrol, we require a visual, at least one visual observer also. Um, it, only one's required, but if you can get more, it's all it's better until it gets to be a crowd, obviously. But anyway, um, when you have your check ride, it's a simulated mission where you're put in a scenario, you meet with a check pilot, I'm the I'm one of three, uh, one of two check pilots in South Carolina with Civil Air Patrol. And um, we say, all right, meet here, you, you know, you need to be able to perform any of these tasks you've been trained on. And we throw a scenario at them, such as, hey, I had a, um, you know, like we did the check ride in Aiken and said, all right, Augusta, um, air, air traffic control call and said a plane fell off the radar, they were on final approach for Aiken Airport, south of the airport on the way in. and you're the first civil air patrol I set on scene, you know, into the area. Instant commander says, get out there and figure something out, find it. So you have, you know, they have to know some basic search theory, where my highest probability of searching, um, where I can do the most good at, the quickest, and um, and then they go out there and then also put into the aeronautical decision making, such as, you know, you don't fly, you know, Aiken Airport, it's, you know, it's not controlled, you know, down at ground level. You know, there's no control power. You don't fly right into the runway. That's stupid. Legally, can you do it? Yeah, it's not in controlled airspace, but should you? No, you should not because the, there's no TFR or anything, and you're liable to get in the way, and then we have a problem. And so they move out, and again, being able to tell an instant commander, no, or I can do this with some, other you know clearances and things like that, like a lance approval or getting uh, you know the SGI things like that. Um, and then finally, when they they prove that they can go and handle that mission, by, basically by themselves, because drones are new to civil air patrol. We've got a bunch of fixed wing planes, we've got a large fleet of Cessnas in the country, but and everybody knows basically what a plane can do, but. None of these commanders know what a drone can do and what we can't do and what we're not allowed to do and what we are allowed to do. So that pilot is basically the subject matter expert that has to be able to know the limits and capabilities and say, hey, yeah, I can do this, or no, I can't do this. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to call the problem or whatever, and that kind of thing. And then with my police department, with Aiken Public Safety, our program's still in its infancy. And, um, you know, with that, we've got to, you've got to be able to do the NIST VPER at least two hours and do a check ride um, to show that you know you know you can operate in a tactical environment or you know do a search whatever that kind of thing and also knowing the legal limitations of what law enforcement can do with a drone can I look here can I look there no you can't not without a search warrant things like that and be able to tell that as a commander that investigator that captain whatever I can do this or I can't do this. Here's what I need you to do for me to be allowed to do this. So that's what we're doing in Aiken and with Civil Air Patrol. So it's, uh, it can be pretty complex like you're talking about. So, sure. so one thing I'd add uh, in terms of training, uh, so Part 107 states that the remote pilot in charge is responsible for the overall operation. That doesn't mean he has to be manipulating the controls of the drone. He's the overall, he's the overall commander of that operation. <clears throat> Part of our training is to grow our PICs. It's a big difference between manipulating controls and taking a cold phone call and figuring out on the way there, what do we have to do to do this safely? What do we have to do to do this legally? Uh, are we familiar with that environment? One of the other things about night flight, I'll say about environment. <clears throat> in the daytime, we had the luxury of being able to see everything around us, almost a panoramic view. Everything makes sense. The vertical stuff makes sense. The horizon makes sense. At night, that goes away. So, <clears throat> if you know, if you know, you, you, if you if you've got enough time to do it, and you're going to fly at night, and you know you're going to be flying at night, go scout that area out before you even launch. Because at night when you drive up, you're not going to be able to see some unlit 100-foot tower 
uh, power lines, transmission lines. <coughs> the only clearing you see, <coughs> you think it's clear, but there's a transmission line there. So very important uh, if you can do it, if you can get there in daylight, even a little bit before nightfall, it uh, gives time for your eyes to adjust and it gives you time to uh, spec out the environment. But uh, I would say that, you know, you know, we, I'm on its group, this national group uh, with the FAA. Um, <clears throat> there's always the ongoing, uh, I'll be generous, dialogue between the helicopter associations and the drone associations <coughs> to where the helicopters say they're a threat to our safety, they're flying in the same airspace, and then the drone association says, well, <coughs> you, you should get out of our way. Well, there's two problems with that. Unlike fixed wing, there is no minimum altitude regulation for helicopters. If I can safely fly 50 feet off the ground between here and Charleston in a helicopter, I can legally do it. I'm not in the drone's airspace, I'm in my airspace. If I come up on a drone, he's in my airspace, right? So there's that ongoing haggling, and of course the drone associations are saying, I got a kick out of this, I was on a webinar the other day. <coughs> I'm not going to mention names, but a well-known drone advocate in the United States, he goes, it's time for the FAA to put a limit on these helicopters. Unless they're taking off and landing, they got no business belief but below 500 feet. I said, well, well, how am I going to pick up water in a Bambi bucket? How am I going to inspect a gas line? How am I going to inspect a power line? How am I going to land on the roof of the, hel of the hospital? That's all below 500 feet. Well, y'all got to do something, meaning the FAA. Y'all got to do something. We already did it. We told you in your regulation, stay away from manned aircraft. I mean, that's the regulation. I do both. I mean, I fly fixed wing helicopters, drones. But I know when I got my drone hat on, that, that there's no wiggle room. It says right there, I can't interfere with a manned aircraft operation. And that goes for everybody in this room. So that's another takeaway. Make no mistake, everybody operating under Part 91 has the responsibility to see and avoid. That's manned fixed wing, manned helicopters, blimps, balloons, whatever. Everybody has to see and avoid. But in the drone world, see and avoid is the responsibility of the drone pilot when he's in the same airspace as a uh, UAS. That's not just in the regulations, that's now embedded in case law. There's been enough cases that when they said, yeah, you, you can't do that. Um, and although we never hear about it, um, there's a lot of drone groups um, famous for telling their members, yeah, you know, don't, don't worry about that regulation. The FAA doesn't have the people, the time, the money to enforce any of this stuff. Well, I, I, they do enforce it. But what they have to do to make a case is just like a criminal case. They have to have evidence. They don't have to see it in person. But if I saw a drone doing this and I say it was on this day, this time, this GPS coordinate, it was a light inspire, um, here's the guy's license plate number that was flying it. They go, pick, you got, do you own a drone? Yeah, can I see it? Yeah. Can I see the registration number? Yeah. Okay, well, we got a report. Yeah, that was me. You know. They can't make a case of a civil violation or a criminal violation without evidence, just like in a criminal case. It's no different. There never is going to be a day like in municipal police department, sheriff's department, SLED, whatever, where there's drone police out patrolling looking for bad drone operators. That's never going to happen. But now, <clears throat> they've given law enforcement a tool to help them do their job. Drone operators now operate, commercially at least, <clears throat> if a cop's got a reason to be talking to him, can't just be fooling with him, has to have a legitimate reason to talk to him, he not only does have to show him his drone license, he has to show him a picture ID that this is actually me, to where they can, they can record that, you know? Um, so. The one thing we say in the FAA, I, I kind of said this initially when I was trying to get a COA, was why are they making everything so hard? Why is everything such a roadblock? But now after doing it, 
for so long and working with the FAA on all of this helicopter stuff and drone stuff. They're not roadblocks, they're building blocks. They couldn't just make it a free-for-all right out of the gate in September 2016 when they cut loose Part 107. It would have just been a free-for-all. You'd have had drones hitting helicopters, no doubt about it. But as remote ID comes along in, in 23, in, in September of 22 this year, every drone coming off the assembly line for commercial purposes is supposed to have remote ID, ID in it already. No clip-ons, no nothing. And then <clears throat> by September of 2023, everybody flying under 107 and everybody flying under a COA will have to be in compliance with the remote ID. So what the remote ID does is it's going to open up. Right now, beyond visual line of sight, it's possible. It's difficult to get, but it's possible. This is going to make that a little bit easier. So it is a building block. And make no mistake, I don't know how long it's going to be. Some people say five years, some people say 10 years. When Amazon and UPS and FedEx and all them are dropping off boxes in neighborhoods, it is going to, it, listen, that's a whole different solar system away from what we're doing right now. That will, that will include drone airways and things where planes and helicopters know just stay out of there, right? But this isn't, this isn't some drone's going to launch from Columbia and drop off a package in St. Matthews. This is very local stuff, but it's going to happen. I just don't know what the timeline is on it. <clears throat> but the FAA, I mean, there's probably no harder working group in the FAA right now than the UAS branch. And it's not huge, but they got really, really smart people running it. They got really good people running it. Conversations daily on how are we going to make this easier for the end user? So it's coming. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this talk for me is <clears throat> to kind of let you know where we are today, give suggestions for this nighttime stuff. Takeaways I want you to walk out of here with are by all means consider position lights. By all means, if you have the opportunity, scout out your location before it gets dark as cold um, and have visual observers. Any uh, last questions? Or? Well, I'll say the, the DOT doesn't have any PDs either. It's just not in our description. So we fly when we can. And uh, is, is what I do as the pilot, the guys I take out with me, I'm going to have them do observations. And then I've been, I might be jumping ahead of the gun, but I use the Zephyr. And uh, I, let them, I, I have them on the laptop, so I'm encouraged to use it as much as possible. And then once they feel comfortable, then I let them, as we're out into a rural area, not a whole lot going on, not down in the middle of the club or anything, but um, I'll let them fly around, a little bit of stick time. Um, my question would be, it, and maybe I'm not familiar, but it, does it have any kind of nighttime simulations? Not yet. Are they working on it? It's, it's on the radar. It's not. Uh, their next uh, release is uh, the BPERF, that's the certification. And, but nighttime is on their um, horizon, and then I don't know exactly how they're going to do it, but thermal too, like simulate thermal. That, that's, a, that's a tough programming challenge if you're familiar with how IR cameras work, but um, it's coming. Cool. Well, you had mentioned briefly about the assignment effort required to maintain records uh, for, for various purposes. And I think that brings up an important conversation related to our expectations from, I guess, the manufacturers as, as far as what records are maintained by the software and the devices themselves. For, so when you mentioned you have to maintain your own independent record of like software updates, to me that just seems some, like something that should be written. We should just expect them to maintain that record on their own and we should be able to query that from them if necessary. Right, so I would hope that as time goes on, we can get more and more to the point where we can just demonstrate in real time, yes, I can show this. I can show these records now by accessing them, just by procedurally maintaining all of my points of connection, whether it's through the logging into whoever's account and through whatever network, yep. or whether it's just making sure that all of the software settings on the device are correct, or whether it's the smart device that you've got plugged into it, making sure that all the permissions are a lot there. 
Uh, I know that you're not going to be able to get away from maintaining some independent third party records just because we all have very special purposes and, and missions. But, you know, I would think that over time we can try to minimize that so that we don't have to spend a lot of time just maintaining our own internal records to show things that really are, should just be in the device history. Right. And, and you're right, most of that is. I mean, air data, you know, is very good at tracking cycles on a battery and flight time and location. You know, there's, there's services that do a lot of that. Um, we're working toward it now with DroneSense and other platforms to centralize it. My, my pilots are spread out around the state, right? So I don't see them every day, but I do need to be able to. And we're, that's the direction it's going to go, but I still, I'm old, maybe I'm old school. <laughs> but I want to keep my, just like my pilots have their logbook in their plane, you know, I want to have a record for my own reference and nothing else. And, and definitely with the, those other records back there to help, you know, reinforce that or back up what I'm saying. But I, for me, it keeps me straight. If I look back and say that, you know, notice that just on my Google chart that I haven't done something, it makes me go check anyway. So it's more, it may be just me and trying to make sure I don't forget something rather than that be the absolute final record, I guess. Yeah. Here's the thing. So <clears throat> I, I, I've always got to be careful to not make it appear I'm advocating for a specific vendor because I'm not. But I will just tell you <clears throat> that we use a uh, flight management system that's available to anybody in this room, really any drone operator. The one we use is specifically for uh, public safety. And I capture every single thing you could ever want to know about the drone, the pilot, anything, all in one place. And I can query that information from my phone sitting here right now. Um, <clears throat> so if you're running one or two drones, you know, hell, I do it. You know, keep a paper trail, keep a log book, and all that stuff for the flights and that sort of thing. But imagine if you build up to 25 drones, like Daryl. Imagine if you build up to 100 drones. You're a state agency managing 100 drones. You're not going to be able to do it on paper. And I will tell you, <clears throat> most of these things are kind of um, intuitive. Um, the, the particular vendor we work with, when we started using it, there were some things I immediately didn't like. Um, but we shared that information with them, and they put their really smart people working on it. And all of those, what I call, um, you know, just holes in it are gone. Um, but, for instance, I mean, <clears throat> anytime we change blades, it goes in the logbook. Anytime we do, you know, a DJI, for instance, a 100-hour inspection, pull the covers off of it, look at all the gears that run the landing gear, look at all the nuts and bolts, look at all the graphite for cracks. Um, you know that all in there? Done. Um, and not only that, get a reminder when the next one's due. I don't have to be counting backwards and say I'm coming up on it. I'll give you an alert on my phone, 100 hour due on drone number two. You know, so, <clears throat> um, and again, one thing about part 107, You know, I, I'm, I'm very candid with the FAA because, I mean, I grew up, I, I've been in manned airplanes and helicopters for 30 years. Um, listen, it's a tough world with the FAA. They want everything from you all the time. I mean, you're flying commercially, it just goes up exponentially. So it's a habit for me now. It's a way of life, keeping records on anything associated with aviation, anything. It's easy to do now. Pipe it in, it's there forever, you know. Um, but again, you know, you don't see anything in Part 107 that says you have to keep a paper maintenance log. Um, <clears throat> but if something goes wrong and you've got a log, if nothing else, that shows our internal policy requires us to pre-flight before every flight, and by the way, here's all of our 100-hour inspections or whatever your particular drone manufacturer recommends. It might be 50 hours, it might be 25. And you've got those dates and just a quick blurb of what you did. Done. We did everything we needed to do. If you say, 
uh, we don't do that. It's gonna. It's just gonna make a bad situation worse. Go ahead. I was just gonna touch on add on that and say that I think that, that, that flexibility and, and um, adjustability for the end user is a, a strength of Part One Hundred Seven in a lot of cases. Just as time goes on and things become more um, information, information management becomes more and more essential, and, and network connection and just and, and, you know interconnectivity and accountability and for purposes of liability, just being able to show all the data. It, you know, on on demand sure. um, would be the expectation I would think in over time for just as, right. from the from the user's perspective. As I'm sitting here using, if I choose these services and I choose this manufacturer and I choose this software, right. it can do that. Or if it can't, it's not. I mean, you know, when you look back at how this, all this stuff came about, <clears throat> I mean. President tells Congress, oh, I'm giving you 18 months to figure out how to integrate UAS into the national airspace. 18 months. That's nothing. Well, 18 months comes along, they've got nothing. Literally nothing. They're still scratching heads going, what? How are we going to do that? And they get like the two-minute warning. I told you to have this done. Get it done. So as I stated before, up to now, it's always been building blocks. In the first wave, from September to 2016, what can we do right now, not, not to avoid a mid-air collision between a manned aircraft and a helicopter below 400 feet, what can we do to mitigate the risk? So that was the first wave of regulations. And then you start building from there. This is working pretty good, probably enough to open it up a little bit. This ain't working, we've got to tighten that up a little. And that's how regulatory stuff works. And unfortunately, unlike a city to where the mayor and city council says, bam, this is what we're doing. I mean, any regulation, I don't care how insignificant it seems to anybody, has to end up in a discussion period, a notice of proposed rulemaking that can last, that alone can ask for a year. But the UAS comments are this thick every time an NPDRM goes out, every time. Air Pilot, Airline Pilots Association, Ag Pilots Association, Drone Associations, everybody in the world says, don't do that, they're already a nuisance. And then the drone people are going, we can do it safely. And then they have to meet somewhere in the middle. It's an ugly deal. It's, 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 it's hard work, um, but that's how you get there. It's really the only way to get there. All right, guys, I think we're, I think we're out of time. So I really thing, appreciate our panel. One last, uh, one last thing oh, I forgot to bring up. If you're going to do this at night, and I meant to bring this up earlier, buy some red headlamps okay. and protect your night vision when you're out there prepping your drone and everything. Cause, and it's in all the training for night vision. But you know, spending $100 to buy your crew red headlights and stuff will save you a lot of time. And make, make sure you're maintaining your night vision. That's something we learned the first time we tried it. We all had these really nice, cool bright lights for going out and finding fires. They don't work for this stuff. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it'll, I learned that the hard way and I don't want you guys to all do that. So, buy a bunch of red headlights. Right, now, let me give you that real quick, especially for our public safety folks. I, listen, I, I'll, I'll say it right here. The night operations education you're going to get on the FAA website is minimal. It'll talk a little bit about what we talked about. These other courses I mentioned, it gets so far in the weeds, it makes your head explode. But uh, I'm glad Daryl brought that up. For all of us out here that are out here in the middle of the night, public safety folks, <coughs> make sure your own people know. If somebody rolls up on you and you're in a landing zone, takeoff zone, and it's dark, make sure they come in there not lit up. Because if you happen to look back and even see their headlights, let alone lights that are moving all over the right. place, when you look back up or look at your iPad, you're not going to be able to see anything. Big rule out there is maintain your night vision. Yep. If there's street lights or something around there that might pop on, any kind of sensor light that's might pop on, turn your back to them. Because I mean, your oh, night, what little bit of night vision you have goes away immediately the minute something goes on, even a flashlight. One more question. I, I'm sorry, I know we're at time, but I got I, one thing we haven't really talked about and with respect to night vision, I'm curious how it changes things. I imagine in your line of work, Daryl, a lot of your flights are, you know, pre-planned pre through either DJI pilot or 
PIX 4D or something like that where you're, you're flying a predetermined path. Does night, uh, th does night flying change how you approach that? Are you more likely to fly predetermined or more likely to free fly at night? Or is it? But I would, most of the time it's, it's not just pre-planned flights, I would say. Um, you know, we, the way we use it the most is a fire and we're trying to find the perimeter or find the... So it's a volatile situation. So, yeah, to so we'll, we'll fly little bits of the line and work around it. Um, you know, my best option is to get a, a infrared flight to come in, but they're not here very often and they cost, you know, more than my whole drone program <laughs> for, for one flight. So we don't do that very often. Um, but, you know, we'll fly the critical pieces. You know, initially we, we, we just... Um, make a decision where the critical pieces are behind the houses where the most threat is and we, we punch those lines first and pre-flight, you know, follow the perimeter. Now, I, I do import, you know, KMZs or KMLs onto my flight controller off of the system. And we always use some kind of geofencing, you know, for the night flights too. So within the geofence, you know, that we set up with a KML or something, we'll fly within those. But most of the time, it's kind of on the fly. You know, I have people who have seen it during the daytime or aircraft that have been there in the daytime that can help me find, you know, hazards and identify that stuff. I, you, you mentioned going out to California, and I, I know sure. that we've talked about you having to go. And I can't imagine, like anywhere we fly, we've been there a hundred times. We know, I can't imagine showing up to terrain I've never seen in my life. And then, okay, we're going to, you know, go fly in smoke and there's lights all over the place. <laughs> if my hair was longer, it'd be great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. But good question. Great question. All right, guys. Well, we'll, we'll leave it there. But before we kind of break, a couple of, couple of quick notes. Um, um, one, these guys are hanging out for a couple of minutes here. So if you guys have questions that you want to reach out to these guys individually and talk, uh, please do. Again, a reminder, we got a couple of posters here that we're going to kind of stand next to just to kind of see what some of us are doing. So come by and see us. And also, guys, this is you guys are amongst your peers of other drone operators. So if you haven't met somebody, I would encourage you to meet someone, ask them what they're what they do, why they're using drones, and, and just kind of further that networking.